So we're going to start to go back to talking about chemical reactions today. But we're going to talk about them in a little bit in a different way. So if you wanted to classify this reaction, if you wanted to say what was going on there, how would you classify that? Combustion. You'd say it was combustion. And when you have a combustion reaction, you have something that reacts with, there's one other thing that's always present in a combustion reaction, oxygen. oxygen. So you know when you burn something, you need the oxygen, right? It's actually a reaction with oxygen. That's what's going on here. It just happens very fast and gives off a lot of heat when it does it. When something rusts, what reaction is going on there? It's oxidation. It's reacting with oxygen. So here you have the match reacting with oxygen from the air. It's oxidizing. Here we have steel or iron that's rusting. It's reacting with oxygen in the air. So if you wrote the chemical reactions out for this, you're going to take something plus oxygen yields products. And this one is something plus oxygen yields products. So they're more or less the same reaction. But what can you say about the rates of these reactions? And rate is the speed at which they occur. One's very fast and one's very slow. Right. This one is very fast. This one is very slow. This one, you're racing to light all the birthday candles before it burns your finger, but you're not racing to light the birthday candles before <laughs> your steel chain out on the porch rusts, right? So this one happens fast, this one happens slow, but it's more or less the same reaction. Mm -hmm. So why does this one happen fast when this one happens slower? And there are a number of things that we can do that change the rate at which a reaction occurs. So this rate is just a measure of how fast it happens. How fast do the reactants become products? One thing that you know, can, or at least could guess, is temperature. Temperature affects how fast a reaction happens. In most cases, if you heat a reaction, it's going to happen faster. Cooking is an example. If you took your spaghetti, uh, that, that's, not good. that's not a reaction. <coughs> that's not a reaction either. <laughs> what, what, what's, tell me, what, what's a chemical reaction that cold. happens in Moon everyday shining. life? <laughs> what? Cooking like <laughs> meat changes, right? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a physical change, it's not a chemical change. It's about the road crash. <laughs> they're, they're, they're changing shit. So that's the end of class. But, well, it's a physical change. It's a huge thing. That, that's, that's a physical change. I'm leaving crack on the table. You can take it. <laughs> I'm not touching your crack. That's what they all say. Well, let's do it this way. In the lab, we had that magnesium, right? What happened when we put the magnesium in the fire? It went psh, right? What happened when we didn't put it in the fire? didn't go psh, right? All we did when we put it in that fire is we added heat. If we left that magnesium sitting out, decades from now, the students would come in and they wouldn't have any magnesium to put in the fire because it would have very, very, very slowly done that reaction. At room temperature, it would have done that reaction. We put it in the fire, it got hot, and it went very quickly. So in most cases, Raising the temperature 
will make your reaction go faster. This is something you haven't dealt with in a lab too much yet. If you increase the concentration of your reactants, it's going to make the reaction happen faster. So we'll talk about why, but if you have two molecules in a solution and they're going to react, they have to hit each other. If you only have a few of this type of molecule and a few of this, they're going to fly around for quite a while before they hit each other. If you have a bunch of them, they're constantly hitting each other and they're reacting a whole lot faster. If your, reactants, if your reaction includes a solid, the amount of surface area of that solid will also increase the reaction rate. Just like when we had our sugar cube dissolving in the water versus the granulated sugar, in order for, in that case, for the sugar to dissolve, it could only dissolve if it was touching the water around it. If you were stuck in the middle of that sugar cube, you weren't touching the water. If you're not touching the water, you can't dissolve in the water. So now imagine we take our magnesium and we put it into hydrochloric acid. Do you remember what happened when you did that? It bubbled. The magnesium reacts with the hydrochloric acid. Now imagine that magnesium goes in there. For it to react with the hydrochloric acid, it has to be touching the hydrochloric acid. So do you think it would react faster if you took a chunk of magnesium and put it in hydrochloric acid, or if you took that chunk of magnesium you broke it up into a whole bunch of little pieces and put it in the, in the hydrochloric acid. Well, Which one's going to react faster? B. What was B? Um, yeah. Where you broke it apart. Where I broke it apart. And why is it going to react faster if it's broken apart? More surface area. More surface area. If there's more pieces, there is more surface area. And so you get more of the magnesium reacting <coughs> at once. And the last one, this one's the little, the, probably the fuzziest. This one's going to take the most chem explaining to talk about. But if you add a catalyst, it makes the reaction go faster. So this is the same reaction. We take two reactants. We're going to mix them together, and then we're going to put the balloons back on. Okay. So looking at this one, we mix them two, and here put a balloon on. Mix them in here, put a balloon on. Which one would you say had the higher reaction, higher concentration of reactants? Well, <coughs> no, that's the right. So. This one, right? Yeah. This one's reacting a whole lot faster. The reaction is making a gas. And so we can measure how far the reaction has gone based on how much gas is formed. So this one is reacting a whole lot faster because the reactants were much more concentrated. So a high concentration makes the reaction rate faster. Here's another example. This is looking at surface area. Steel, when you leave it in contact with oxygen, what's it going to do? It's going to rust, which is oxidized. But it happens really, really, really slowly. If you hook it up to electricity and you get it really hot, it'll oxidize a whole lot faster. So on the left and the right, we have the same mass of steel. On the left, it is a nail form. On the right, it's steel wool. Which one of those two, you can't see the steel wool, hopefully you know what steel wool looks like, which one will have the most surface area? Steel wool has more iron than it throws on the surface than the same mass of iron nail. Right. Correct. Um, <laughs> 
I think, yeah, I, was, I was just supposed to ask, where did you read that from? So steel wool, it looks like a cotton ball, but it's metal, not cotton. And so if you have the same mass, you have more surface area in steel wool, so it can rate all of it, pretty much all of it can react with the oxygen at the same time. So when you hook it up to electricity, this one just kind of glows from getting hot, and it's reacting, but only the iron on the outside can react. In the steel wool, pretty much all of it can react at once. So you get sparks flying everywhere. So increasing the surface area makes the reaction happen faster. This is what happens when you add a catalyst. So this is a piece of liver. I don't know from what type of animal. We'll say it's human. I don't know. All livers look the same. If you put hydrogen peroxide on a liver, there's an enzyme in the liver called catalase, because it's a catalyst, that breaks up this into hydrogen and oxygen. So if you take hydrogen peroxide and you just let it sit there over a long period of time, it's going to break apart. But with a catalyst, it happens a whole lot faster. And so you see it bubbling rather than it happening over a co the course of years. So to figure out and talk about why these things happen, we have to come up with a theoretical model of what's happening at the molecular scale in a reaction. <laughs> and if we have that, we can talk about why reaction rates change when we change these this is just like the kinetic molecular theory where we said pressure comes from the atoms and molecules hitting the, out, hitting the outside of the container. So for a reaction to occur, according to the collision theory, the two molecules that are going to react, they have to hit each other. That's step number one. If they don't hit each other, they can't react. And when they hit, they have to hit in the right orientation. If the pointer is supposed to react with the squirt end of this bottle and it hits like that, it's not going to react. It has to hit like that. So the molecules flying around, occasionally they hit like that, sometimes they hit like that. Every once in a while they hit like that. When they hit like that, they can react. In no other orientation can they react. They also have to hit with enough energy. If they hit each other, but they're not moving fast enough when they hit each other, they're not going to react. And we'll talk about why in terms of energy, but think of it this way. If you want to simplify it, things that are moving really fast when they hit each other they're more liable to stick to each other. If they just are moving really slow, they might just kind of bounce off of each other, keep on their own way. So we have to come back to our energy diagrams. We talked about energy diagrams before. So this was when we had, we had a graph. Here we had, time, here we had energy where that went up, and then we said you could have a reaction that looked like that, or you could have a reaction that looked like that. What type of a reaction is that? Endothermic. It absorbed heat, so what type of a reaction is that? Exothermic. We completely ignored this giant bump in the middle. And nobody bothered to ask what it was. Today we come back and we talk about what the heck that bump is and what does it mean. So this is the activation energy or the activation barrier. Okay? So you can think of it as the energy needed to get to a happier place. 
Okay? So in this example, I'm at home, I'm sitting on the couch. I'm in a pretty low state, I'm also pretty happy. But I want ice cream. But I don't have ice cream. I know though that if I get ice cream and I come back to my couch, I'll be happier than I currently am sitting on the couch without ice cream. But to get ice cream, I have to go to the store, okay, to get it so I can come back. So then it's a matter of thinking, okay, <clears throat> yes, I'll be happier with the ice cream, but do I have enough energy to actually get up, go to the store, and come back? So this, that's exactly what's going on in a reaction. The reactants start here with a certain amount of energy. They're going to end up in an exothermic reaction down here. They want to get from here to here, but to get from here to here, mm -hmm. they have to go over this hill. And so it's a matter of, do they have enough energy to get themselves to the top of the hill so that they can come down to where they actually want to be? So this is the same exact type of graph with our molecules. So this is a reaction between ozone and NO. Okay? These are our reactions, our reactants. They're going to react with each other. We said they have to hit each other. They also have to hit each other in the right orientation. In this case, the nitrogen here has to interact and hit what are the end oxygens here. If this was flipped around and the oxygen hit an oxygen, nothing is going to happen. If the nitrogen hit that oxygen, nothing is going to happen. So they're flying around, they hit each other in the right orientation, so that nitrogen hits the oxygen, and they hit hard enough to stick we form what we call the transition state. The transition state is sort of halfway between the reactants and the products. It's that split second in time where everything is stuck together. So the transition state is not something you can actually see. It's not something you can pick out of a reaction. If you had a, a microscope that could see molecules, you would have to look at it at that nanosecond in order to see this. Because as soon as you pick it out, by the time you actually go to look at it again, it's now back. So this is more or less a theoretical state. To get from the reactants to the transition state, you have to have what we call the activation energy. It's like getting to the top of the hill at a roller coaster. You have to have the chain to take you from the station to the top of the hill. And this activation energy is the energy that we said they had to have when they hit. We said they had to hit hard enough to react. If they don't hit hard enough, they're not going to get up to the top of the hill. And they're just going to come back. So they're going hit, to keep hitting each other going part way up the hill and coming back until they get enough speed that when they hit, they get to the top. And when they get to the top, then they can go the direction they want to go. So we have the reactants, the transition state, and the products. So you need to be able to label four things on this graph. The reactants, the transition state, the products, and the activation energy. The activation energy is always the difference between the reactants and the transition state. And so if the reactants were down here, it would just be from here to here. Four things on that graph. So we had to talk about that before we could talk about why catalysts help. 
The other ones we can talk about and explain with our collision theory. Catalysts don't help with that. This is our reaction, our red one. This is what we started, our starting point. We have our reactants, they come up to the transition state, they come down to the products. But they have to hit each other really hard. And that's a really large activation energy. It's a big hill that you have to get over. When you add a catalyst, it takes that activation energy and it decreases it. It more or less breaks it up into two pieces and so you have to get over two small hills. But if, you, if you've ever ridden a roller coaster, you can imagine if you get to the top of that one, and you come down here, it's going to be easy to get over that one. So in this case, they only have to hit each, up, each other with enough energy to get to here, not there. So if you have millions or billions of collisions going on in a container, and they're trying to react, a greater percentage of those collisions are going to be hard enough. If you lower the bar, more of them are going to be able to jump over. And so a catalyst increases reaction rate by decreasing the activation energy. You've probably heard of catalytic converters. They're in your car. Okay? What they do is they take pollution coming out of your engine and convert it into other things. Yes, it's converting it into greenhouse gases, but at least they're not going to kill us immediately. Okay. Hmm? That's not where you live. <laughs> so, I honestly don't, is anybody a mechanic? Does anyone know what a catalytic converter looks like? Is that a catalytic converter or is that an odd-shaped muffler? I mean, that's possibly it. Okay. Because I think mufflers have the same technology in them also. And so in this case, that's just oxygen. This is carbon monoxide. That's what you don't want to breathe that comes out of your engine. And so the platinum in the catalytic converter, platinum and palladium, basically grabs onto that oxygen, it grabs onto the carbon monoxide, and allows them to react together. And so now you get carbon dioxide, and then there's an oxygen. And so if you get two of these happening next to each other, you now then have two oxygens <coughs> that come off as O2. And so you started with O2 and carbon monoxide, and you end up with O2 and carbon dioxide. So this is the type of question that you would get in terms of an energy diagram. You have to draw them and label them. Somebody want to come and draw it? Multiple people immediately shook their head no. <laughs> but nobody's saying yes. I'm not connecting B and C or A and B or whatever I'm missing here. OK. So we're going to draw an energy diagram. That was the graph, right? So, let's start with our axes. We've got general x and y axes. What was the label on my x axis? Time. Time is increasing going that way. What's the label on my y axis? Energy. And energy increases that way. Okay. So there are four things we said we had to label, right? One of them was, by definition, just the difference between two of them. So there are three points on this graph that we have to plot and then basically connect them. What is the first one? Starting on the left, 
What's the first point? The reactor. So it doesn't tell us where to start. So where can I put my reactors? They have to be on the left side. How far up? In the middle. They can be anywhere except the very bottom. Mm -hmm. They cannot be at zero. They can be anywhere above zero. So to make it easier to draw, let's just say it's in the middle. So those are our reactants. What's the next state? We go from reactants transition state. to transition state. Does it say how high the transition state is? No. So where can we put the transition state? At a point much higher. It has to be higher than the reactants. The transition state is always higher than the reactants. So as long as you are somewhere above this line, you're OK. So we're going to say that is our transition state. Now, what's the last place we have to plot? Products. Where do our products have to be? In between those two. Between those ten donors. Right. This one has a definite location, that, or at least a range that it has to be in. It says it's an endothermic reaction. If it's an endothermic reaction, it's absorbing heat. So it has to be above the reactants. But the products have to always be below the transition state. The transition state is always at the top, which means our products can be anywhere between here and here. So let's just put them there. So now we can plot and draw our graph. So it says, shows the relative energies, the reactants, products, and the transition state. Reactants, transition state, products. I'm also going to now add, we have to label the activation energy. Where is the activation energy here? Right, it's this. And activation energy is an E for energy with a little a, A for activation. So that's the activation energy, is there. That is the type of question that I would ask you to do. Okay? This one takes it a little bit further, it makes you think about it. To label it with molecular representations of reactants, products, and the possible structure for the activated complex, which is another term for the transition state. So what do you think NO2 looks like? I'm not going to make you go through the whole Lewis structure thing at this point. But in general, what would you say NO2 looks like? Looks bent. We'll say it looks bent. And so we'll say it has a dark nitrogen and two light colored oxygen. Okay. And so this one's going to be the tricky one to draw. So let's start here with the product. What do you think our products are going to look like? So we have two different products, right? We have NO and O2. So we said nitrogen was dark, oxygen was light. So we have NO and we have O2. That's what our products look like. The transition state's a tricky one. You're going to have to think about this. The transition state is halfway between that and that. How can we draw that? What is that going to look like? And I'll give you a hint. Clearly, there are three oxygens over here and only two here. And so we're going to have to use multiple of these to do this reaction. But where is that oxygen coming from? We only we only have one reactant. 
That's all we have. You have two NO2s. How, what are they going to look like? How are they going to be oriented? Like that? Like the reactor? So you say we've got. That? No, it's side by side because one of those oxygens has to be the other. Right. The, tr the transition state we're looking for is the act, what it looks like in the process of reacting. And so in this case, they're not hitting each other, they're not connected, they're not reacting. But if we draw it like this, then we have sort of a temporary bond forming between them. And so if those two oxygens come together, we're going to get O2. And when that happens, we now have that, we have that, and we have that. So two of these come together to look like that to give us two of those and one of those. Does that make sense? You have to picture what atoms want to react in this case, the, uh, one of the oxygens from each one is going to react to basically draw a temporary bond between them and see what it looks like after. So that's exactly what we did. Ours looks just like this, only much better, if I would say so. Okay, so that's a reaction rate. Next thing we're going to talk about is equilibrium. We talked about equilibrium in a different sense. In what sense did we talk about equilibrium? I'm going to last week or two weeks ago. Pressure. Vapor pressure. We said that if you have a liquid in a closed container, the liquid will evaporate until it hits the vapor pressure. When it hits the vapor pressure, then the molecules from the liquid will be going into the gas state at the same rate as the gas is going into the liquid. And so, if that happens, the ratio between the gas and the liquid stops changing. So when we look at it, it looks like things are no longer happening. Overall, they're not. But individual atoms and molecules are going back and forth. So this is reaction equilibrium. So if we say equilibrium, is when you have two processes going in opposite directions and they're happening at the same rate. So in terms of a, re of a reaction, that means the reactants are going to the products, but the reaction can actually go backwards. And if it can go backwards, then we can have a situation where the reactants are going to products at the same rate that the products are converting back into reactants. So this is an example of that. So N2O4 will randomly break apart to give us two NO2s. So this is what we're starting with. We're starting with a bottle of N2O4. Over time, some of them will break apart to give us NO2s. Give it some more time, and now we have more NO2s. But if you give it even more time, nothing has changed between D and C. Because when these are flying around, if two of the NO2s happen to hit each other, they can form N2O4. So this reaction is now at equilibrium. The N2O4 is breaking apart at the same rate that the NO2s are coming back together to form N2O4. How would you store that if the if that reaction is always happening? How would you store the N2O4? You can't. So even here, they have a little bit, when they're starting, they got one of the NO2s showing. You'd have to generate this and use it. Otherwise, you'd have to store it at equilibrium and then do something to it to, to 
push it this way. We'll talk about how you can do that before you can use it. So we're going to talk about these equilibriums in math. This looks really scary. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking that looks really scary. These calculations are really easy. Okay? Believe me, they're easy. First thing we have to look at. Brackets. Have we talked about brackets yet? Brackets mean concentration. So if you have brackets around C, that means the concentration of C. So this is our reaction, our generalized reaction that we're going to have. We have this reaction, A plus B gives C plus B. The capital letters are the formulas, represent the formulas. The lowercase letters represent the coefficients in front of them. So if we had an example of Na plus Cl2 gives NaCl. So in this case, we have A and B and C, but there's no D. Do you see that? Yes. And so the lowercase a is a 2. Lowercase b, this is a, that's a. This is b. What is lowercase b? One. It's a 1. It's, writ it's not written, but it's assumed. If NaCl is C, what is lowercase c? Two. Two. And D doesn't exist, so we completely ignore it. It completely comes out of our equation. So when we write, write this, we call it the equilibrium constant. For a reaction in a certain set of conditions, the ratio of the products to reactants will always be the same. It is a constant. And it will do what it has to do to get to the point where it's at that constant. And so K is our constant. And it's KEQ that is the equilibrium constant. So when you write this formula, it is always the products over the reactants. Get that stuck in your head. Products over the reactants. So you take the products, in this case it's C and D, put them in brackets, give them the exponent, that's the coefficient off of them, do the same thing for the reactants. A and B to the powers A and B. And then you will be given the concentrations to plug in and you calculate KBQ. This is an example. That's a reaction that's going on. First thing it wants is what is the equilibrium constant expression? When it's asking for that, it wants the equation. Don't put in any numbers, just give you the equation saying, showing where you would plug numbers in. So if I'm going to write that equation, what is the first thing I'm going to write? KEQ. KEQ. I have KEQ. What's the next thing? Equal sign is the next, it's, it's, it's an easy one. It's products over reactants. Right? So let's just write that. We have products over reactants. Okay? And so what are my products? What are my reactants? Sorry. N2 and H2. N2 and H2. So let's let's start with the reactants. Do the reactants go on the top or the bottom? They go on the bottom. So I'm gonna have N2 as a reactant. I'm going to put N2 in brackets, and I have H2 
as a reactant, I'm going to put it in brackets. What is my product? NH3. So I'm going to put NH3 on top in brackets. Now I can come back and add the exponents. What is the exponent on my N2? It's a 1. The coefficient on N2 is 1. So you can either write that 1 or leave it off. What is the exponent on my H2? 3. three. What is my exponent on my NH3? Two. 2. So you have now written the correct equilibrium constant expression for that reaction. But it looks scary. But it's not. So now it says, what is the value of the equilibrium constant? On paper, you are not going to be given a graph and said, told to pick the information off the graph. It would give you the, the molarities, the concentrations, and you would plug them in. But this one's a little more difficult, but not all that difficult. So we have two graphs. These are the initial concentrations on the left. So we're reacting 0.2 molar N2 and 0.6 molar H2. And because it hasn't started yet, we don't have any product. And it gives us, at equilibrium, these are the concentrations. So we're good. let's rewrite this with numbers. What number is going to go in these brackets? 0 0.280. 0 0.280 is the concentration of the ammonia. And this is squared. What's the concentration of my N2? 0 0.0600 to the first power times what? 0 0.180 0 0.180 cubed. Put that into your calculator. 224. Equals 224. Okay. This has no units. So if you put a unit, you're going to get the unit stamp. This is about the only time you can leave an answer with no units. So the, the value of the equilibrium constant for this reaction is 224. So we won't be given a graph, we'll just give us the numbers? You would, you would just be given total of those three concentrations. They'd be written up for you. We can talk about reactions as being reactants favored or products favored. And all that means is when you look at your ratio here, you look at your fraction, which one is larger? The top product side or the bottom <coughs> reactant side? Um, oh, no, no, wait, wait, no. Oh, no, wait, no. Let's, yeah, so let's think of this in general fraction terms, without even looking in this specific situation. If you have a fraction, okay, and the top number is bigger than the small than the bottom number, and you do that division, is your answer going to be larger than one, one, or smaller than one? Mm -hmm. If the top is larger, your answer will be larger than one. If the top and the bottom are the same, you will get exactly one. If the top is smaller than the bottom, will your answer be larger than one, one, or smaller than one? Smaller than one. So, is this larger than one, one, or smaller than one? It's larger than one, so the top had to have been bigger. And when we write it out, the products are on the top. So we say it's product favor. And it was actually 115. What is? 
then on the bottom section one. It says 224? Yeah. On the slide it says, is the side wrong? I just did it here. So can I get a second? I don't know. Somebody? Yeah. When you were doing the when the formula you first showed the formula you had pluses. Now it's multiplication. Where are the pluses? If there are pluses Go back in to the four lines. Right here at the top or the pluses. That these here? Yeah. That's just a reaction though. That's that's okay. just like when you write a chemical reaction. Okay. That was my bad then. Okay. Yeah. So these are multiplied together. That was my bad then. Better to figure it out now. So we can generalize this product versus reactant phase. If you figure out KEQ and it's larger than one, it's product favored. If it's lower than one, it's reactant favored. If it's one, <coughs> That means you have about the same amount of reactants and products, and so neither one is favored. So if we go back to this, this says it lies to the right, lies to the left. When we start talking about equilibriums, we can talk about reactions moving. And so we talk about reactions moving left to right, or right to left, or favoring the left side, favoring the right side. It just is, is literally what it sounds like. You're looking at this. If it goes left, it goes to the reactants. If it goes right, it goes to the products. If it favors the left side, it's favoring the reactants. That's why if it's more than one, it lies to the right with the products. So here's another example. We have NO2, in this case, becoming N2O4. It wants to write out the equilibrium constant, calculate the value at 25 degrees, and describe, describe the position of the equilibrium. So we have KEQ equals products of the reactants. KEQ equals what? <coughs> so you've got N2O4, the product, there's only one product, over the reactant, NO2. And this is squared because the NO2 has a coefficient of 2. This is just 1 because the coefficient is 1. So we plug in the numbers and we get 1.25 divided by 0 0.0750 squared equals 1. 22. So we've already done 1 and 2. Number 1 says write the equilibrium constant expression, which is that. And it says, number 2 says calculate the value of the equilibrium constant at 25 degrees Celsius. <coughs> Important fact is that it says the reaction is going on at 25 degrees Celsius. So these concentrations that they give you are specific to 25 degrees Celsius. If they ask you to calculate the value at 30 degrees Celsius, 
you would look at me and say, you crazy. You can't do that, okay? These numbers are going to change. So you can only do this if it's asking you for the value at the temperature that it actually is at. So number three, describe the position. What is favored here? It's product favored. It's more than one, so the top is larger, and the top is prime. This looks scary too, just based on the name. The Chatelier. Anybody heard of this? No? Yeah, one nodding, one nodding his head. So we can shift equilibrium. If a reaction is at equilibrium, if we do things to it, it's going to change. Which is why you can't change the temperature. Changing the temperature will shift the equilibrium. So, if we are at equilibrium, if we add reactant, if we add product, if we take out reactant or take out product, it's going to move to get back to equilibrium. That reaction always wants to be in equilibrium. And so we disrupt that equilibrium. It's in its happy place. And we take it out, we take something out, we put something in that wasn't there, and all of a sudden, it's not happy anymore. So it readjusts, it shifts left or right to get back to its happy place. What this guy did was he looked at what actually happens when you disrupt it doing different things. How can we predict what effect doing something to that reaction will have? So we said, if we have a chemical equilibrium, we can add or remove a reactant or a product. We can change the volume of the reaction container. Why would changing the reaction, the volume of a reaction container, matter? It would change the rate of reaction because of pressure. Okay. If you're dealing with a reaction that has gases. And you condense the reaction container, that same amount of gas in a smaller container, it's more concentrated. But if you have a reaction going in a 500 milliliter beaker in water, and you put it into a 1,000 milliliter beaker, it's not going to make a difference. Because it's all happening within the water the reaction volume is staying the same, even if you put it in a larger beaker. So this is only important if you're dealing with gases, which is very rare. We can also change the temperature. That changes the KEQ value. There are huge books of KEQ values that for a reaction, and you look up the temperature, and you figure out what the value is, and you use it. So when we add a product or a reactant, all of a sudden we have too much of that. And so the reaction is going to shift away from it. So this is our general reaction. We have A plus B gives us C plus D. If we are at equilibrium and we add A, all of a sudden we have too much A. And so it's going to shift to the right. If you shift to the right, it's going to do two things. You're going to eliminate some of the extra A, and so the bottom is going to get smaller. So we have products over reactants. If we add A, all of a sudden our reactants are too big. The bottom of our fraction is too big. If we convert reactants to products, all of a sudden we now have less reactants, but we're also increasing our products. So we don't have to convert all of our extra A over to products to reach equilibrium. It's going to be somewhere in between where we started and where we ended. So if we add A, the reaction shifts to the right. It makes more products. 
if we add a product, if we add D, all of a sudden we have too much product. So the reaction is going to shift to the left towards the reactants. If we remove something, the reaction is going to shift towards the void that we just left. If we take something out, it's going to try to make more of what we just took out. So if we remove B, some of our product is going to come back in the reactants. If we remove C, one of our products, then all of a sudden more of our reactants will form products. So this is a really good way to make sure you get the maximum yield. So we did it in the lab on Thursday. I think it was the pre-lab that said, why do you use an excess, right? So imagine you, you, you're doing a reaction and it, it has an equilibrium. When you do your stoichiometry, does it anywhere in that stoichiometry, does it factor in that your reaction is going to stop halfway because of equilibrium? No, it doesn't. So if you add a whole bunch of reactants, if you add a whole bunch of excess reactants, you're going to make it, you're going to push it all the way to the right, and your reactants, reaction is going to go to completion. So this is a representation of it. So here we have yellow molecules in equilibrium with green, and they just convert back and forth. But we always like to have the same ratio of yellow to green. So starting off, we had five of the yellows and a bunch of greens. But we put an eyedropper in, we pulled out some of the yellows. Then we only had three yellows, and our ratio was off. So some of the green converted back to yellow so that we would keep the same ratio. So here's our reaction. We're going to do some things to it. You need to predict which way the reaction is going to shift when we do that. So if we remove silver ion, which way is the reaction going to shift? To the products. It's going to shift to the product side, which is the right side, which is the silver side. So you'd say the reaction is going to shift to the right. It's going to try to replace the silver ion that you just took out. If you add silver nitrate, what's going to happen to this reaction? It's going to put more silver ion there. Right. You have to make that connection. There is no silver nitrate out here, right? But it tells us silver nitrate is water soluble. So you put it in there, it's going to break apart, and it's going to give us more silver ion. So now all of a sudden we have too much of that, so we will shift to the left. What if we add sodium iodide? What's going to happen? It's going to shift to the left. This is going to give us iodide ion it'll shift to the left again. That's the end of equilibrium. Questions on that? Okay. Let's take our break early. We'll start again at 7.10 on that clock.